Out among the green hills it stands, gray and defiant. Like a cruel reminder of humanity, it towers above the tallest of trees that surround it. A monster of cement and metal and flashing lights. It reaches out towards the sky, searching, calling, demanding the attention of something invisible to the human eye. When we first got off the train, she was all laughter and jokes. As we trudged up the hill, she told me stories of how the broadcast tower was actually an old spaceship that was going to fly us to the moon. I tried to keep up with her. I tried to make the hiking trip as conflict-free as possible, but I was a smoker and she wasn't. When I asked to take a break, she obliged, but all the mirth disappeared from her voice. By the time we reached the top of the hill, we weren't talking. We each walked our own path through the strange structure alone, as if we were simply strangers that had just happened to travel together. To her, it was something magical, a piece of architectural genius that deserved to be marveled for its uniqueness. To me, it was just an obnoxious broadcast tower on a slippery cliff. She was filled with awe. I was slightly nauseous from the climb of the hill. We met again at the lookout point next to the tower, and for a while we both just sat on the bench, watching the ground below us, letting our eyes drift from one bastion of civilization to the next through the dark forest. But then the silence became, well, too much for me. I said something. I said something that set her off. She told me I was a spineless child masquerading as a man, that I never thought things through before I said them, that I drank too much, that I didn't care about anyone but myself. In the shadow of that outlandish tower, she verbalized every notion of self-doubt I've ever held. And she added a dozen more. Later, she apologized, but that memory stayed. She would forever tell me that I'm irreparably broken, and the broadcast would forever overshadow us. The sun is barely up when the conductor wakes me. It's the last stop on the train, and it's time for me to get off. Vague notions about who I am dimly glow beneath a thick mental fog. As soon as I open my mouth to ask where I am, he, he takes a step back. My breath reeks of vodka. Before reality properly clicks into place, I'm standing in a train station hundreds of kilometers from home. The hills stretch out around me in an oppressive fog. At first I'm confused about where I am, but soon, through that fog, I see those blinking lights. All of the food in the vending machine looks suspect, but I end up buying a sandwich. I hope that some bread will help me soak up the poison in my stomach, but after three bites I pause eating permanently. The sandwich tastes like plastic and medicine. I try to force myself to take another bite, but I just end up standing in the middle of the train station with the piece of bread limply hanging from my hand. The broadcast tower watches me, its lights shining through the morning fog. It stands out in those hills, waiting. I go back to the vending machine and buy an energy drink. From the colorful can, a friendly alien waves a three-fingered hello. The sweetness of the beverage is borderline aggressive, but it keeps my eyes open. With a feeling of chemical electricity humming in my veins, I set off towards the shining concrete spire in the fog. When we first hiked up to that hill, the path through suburbia was paved in a bright summer sun. Children ran around us playing their make-believe games. Gardeners loudly remarked on the beauty of the day. People leaned out of their windows to say hello to the cute hiking pair. Yet as I make my way toward the bottom of the hill, the streets are dead, and every curtain is drawn. Everything is different, except for those blinking lights. Flashing in the dim distance, the tower calls to me, like a siren of concrete and electricity. As the asphalt changes into a forest road, the spire disappears between the crowns of tired trees. Twigs snap beneath my feet like sharp words during an argument. The muddy trail clings to my shoes like unwanted baggage and makes each step heavy. My breaths become more and more labored. Losing track of the lights makes me lose track of my destination. I find myself thinking about how soft the seats in the train back to the city would be, about how a bit of sleep could rid me of the hangover rustling in my core, about how I should go home. 
my steps slow. The absurdity of my journey starts to bloat and fester in the recesses of my mind. The neurotic sack of thoughts threatens to burst and send me tumbling back down the hill towards home. But before that doubt-filled pustule pops, I come across a familiar sight. Even though the spot is a stone's throw away from the hiking trail, the land looks completely untouched. Like a blanket of fuzzy mold, a thick layer of moss covers the clearing. A slice of paradise beckons my tired knees. As immaculate as the ground is, it doesn't take me long to find the spot where her and me took a break. Amongst those delicate tendrils of life, I find a pile of cigarette butts. Like malformed baby teeth, they lie in the moss, their orange pampering gone, but the dirty white of their filter is present and unrotting. The treetops sway in the gentle mountain wind as far-off birds sing a quiet grey morning song, but all that I can hear are echoes of her voice. Once upon a time, she loved me. I'm almost certain of that. But all that I can remember of her is the cruelty. I lie in that bed of moss, desperately hoping for a flash of insight, some sort of magical thought that would make it all okay, but none comes. Instead, faint droplets of rain leak from the sky. I consider going home, and the thought almost manifests into action. But as I take my final look at the branch-filled sky, I see a flash of green and red. A tower. It's still reaching out for me. With no other direction in life, I accept its call. The journey up the hill is drenched in discomfort. The colorful energy drink in my jacket pocket does little to hydrate me. My lungs demand respite at every bend of the trail, and without her leading the way, I I find my feet on unsteady ground. The trail transforms from a road of dirt to a jagged path of rock. Instead of looking at the nature around me, my eyes are forced to the ground. Each step requires caution and balance, and I nearly lose my footing in multiple panic-ridden moments, but when? The path finally comes. The tower looms ahead of me. When we visited during the summer, there was at least a dozen cars parked next to the metal spire. People were snapping pictures of the overlook. The communist-era cafeteria at the base of the structure was filled with hungry customers. But now, as I walk through those cement grounds, there's no one. The parking lot is empty, and the long tables in the cafeteria are draped in darkness and dust. It's as if the grey sky had blotted out all trace of humanity, only left a barren carcass in its stead. The mountain wind is frigid and sharp, and for a while I stand by the cafeteria, trying to regain some semblance of warmth, but loitering in the lifeless shell of concrete only strengthens the aching in my heart. I think about calling her, but I don't. Instead, I walk outside and sit on a familiar bench. The bench was the point of no return. It was on that bench that we had our argument. At points, we stood and pointed fingers. At times, we paced around the nearby gravel, but most of the conflict was spent sitting on the bench in silence, processing. Last night, as I attempted drowning the emptiness that rattled in my lungs, I thought that sitting back at the centerpiece of my personal cataclysm would help fix whatever was wrong with me. Past the hangover and exhaustion, it's difficult to figure out how accurate that notion was. First all I met with are deafening memories of her words, but as I sit on that bench and look out at the world below, something else starts churning in my core. I came to the tower searching for some semblance of relief, or joy, or, or meaning, but... My soul shudders beneath a wholly different sensation. For a moment, the wind dies down, but its work continues drifting across the sky. Oppressive bursts of grey travel through the heavens like wild horses. Behind them, mountains of pure white cloud slowly collapse beneath an unseen force. There are holes in the misty painting through which rays of sun trickle down to the earth below. They travel through the forests and fields and towns like spotlights, searching for survivors off some horrid battle. 
Off on the horizon sits the local power plant, drenched in a burst of dying red sunlight. It looks like it's burning. The vista in front of me clears my mind of her presence, but it replaces the pain with fear. Thoughts of my heartbreak drift into meaninglessness. But so does everything else. The dying sky that stretches out in front of me makes me feel impossibly small. The world around me is dying. And I'm just a writhing worm in its decomposing corpse. There's a storm coming, she says, in a voice gentle as silk. Sitting next to me on the bench is a woman wearing a white flowing robe. She's pale to the point of sickliness, but her thin lips carry a, a friendly smile. When her dark eyes meet mine, she nods towards the blinking tower. Beyond it, a pitch black cloud slowly seeps towards us on the back of a steadily growing wind. Ah, I, <laughs> I didn't see you there, I say. Last night's drink leaps from my breath, but she doesn't flinch. You can come and join us in the cafeteria. The rain will be here soon, she says. Behind the windows of the tower, I see light and movement. I thought the cafeteria was closed, I say. My throat feels like sandpaper. I take a sip of the colorful energy drink, but it doesn't help. It just makes my throat feel like sandpaper covered in mucus. We have water, she says. And then, as if on command, a soft drizzle starts descending from the sky. The approaching black clouds pick up in speed. The wind becomes more cruel. Her offer of shelter and water couldn't be more attractive, but there's something about her eyes that gives me discomfort. It's as if they were stretched upwards, just the smallest bit. Oh, it's okay. I have this, I say taking another sip of the chemical swill in my hand. You look like a man who could use a drink of water, she says, politely smiling. Also, there's a storm coming. For beneath the steadily advancing blackness comes a faint thunderclap. The drizzle turns to sluggish chunks of cold rain. As I look at the woman's face, I realize it's, it's not just her eyes that seem off. Beneath her thin, smiling lips, there's only a slight bump before her neck begins. It's as if her face was sculpted by hands that forgot humans are meant to have chins. Let us help you, she says, with kindness in her voice. Who's us? I ask. Just some friendly fellow travelers, she replies. Another thunderclap sounds off behind the tower, but this one is louder. I can feel its dark rumble in my chest. The woman's face is discomforting, but there's a compassion in her strange eyes, and even without a chin, her smile seems genuine. Okay, I say, and then wordlessly, she leads me to the tower. When I enter the cafeteria, they all look at me with their dark eyes. There's about a dozen of them, men and women all with bleached skin and flowing robes, all chinless. Unprepared for the attention of a room full of people, I, I nervously mumble out a greeting. They mumble back, as, <laughs> as if mocking my intonation, but their lean-lipped smiles simmer with warmth. Outside, another bolt of lightning meets its target. The plexiglass windows of the cafeteria shake under its thundering force, and then... As if the unbridled electricity ripped something in the sky, a thick downpour starts. I look at the crowd of frail strangers in front of me and, and say something about how lucky I am to not be standing outside, but I don't think they hear me. I barely hear myself past the barrage of rain and thunder outside, but they all politely nod at my comment. The storm beyond the cafeteria grows like television static. It hides the world beyond in a heavy cloak of water and black clouds. Another wave of regret washes through me. I wish I was better at resisting my urges. I, I wish I didn't drink so much the night prior. I, oh, I wish I was back home. So what brings you to the metal spire? She asks, 
as she hands me a glass of water. I don't plan on telling the truth. The words, spontaneous hike, linger on my lips, but as soon as I take a sip of the water, my throat loosens. I don't know, I say. The taste of artificial fruit and stale booze washing out of my mouth. I think I'm looking for something, but... Ugh, I don't know. The robed gathering retains their polite smiles. From somewhere in the crowd, I hear a faint grinding sound, as if a piece of machinery was trying to make its way into a socket. But before I can trace the source of the sound, she speaks again. You are not the first one, and you are not the last one, she says. The metal spire calls out to those that are broken, those that are lost, those that lack a guiding light in the darkness of the world. As she speaks, the world outside grows increasingly dim. The warm light of the cafeteria feels like a guiding beacon of hope in a world of cold, wet entropy. Are you lost, friend? She asks. Aren't we all kind of lost? I half joke, forcing my voice to speak past the downpour outside. They don't respond. They just politely smile and watch me with their strange dark eyes. Yes, I finally say, feeling the pain in my chest turn to honesty. I got out of a relationship that wasn't good for me. You know, I, I, I know it was the right thing to do, but right now without her I just feel a bit lost. The grinding sound returns. I see its source. In the back of the room stands a frail man with a sickly mustache that's too big for his chinless face. Behind his polite smile, his jaw grinds with a hungry effort. Ah, love, she says, with a tone of someone who's seen everything under the sun. Lost souls come here because of crushed dreams and broken promises. But injured hearts are the most common affliction of the pilgrim. No knife cuts deeper into the human spirit than the blade which severs connections. The grinding behind the pale man's lips becomes more animated. A hint of that labored chewing starts to travel through the rest of the faces around the cafeteria. The queer eyes of the robed group remain focused on me, unblinking. Who are you? I ask taking a step back. We are here to help, she says. She's the only one of the group who isn't grinding her teeth behind her smile. We are here to make sure the pilgrims who have made their journey to the metal spire find what they are looking for. We are here to mend your broken spirit. Is there any food? I ask, partially because of the emptiness of the pit of my stomach, but mainly because of the procession of grinding teeth. Yes, the moustached man says taking a step towards me. Yes, there is food. With one gentle motion of her arm, she reaches out to stop the man's advance. She hisses at him, as if he were a disobedient animal. For a split second, the man's smile fades and his mustache drops to make way for a starving grimace. But then, with a step back and a shake of his head, the polite smile returns. The grinding of the teeth, however, does not disappear. It grows more frantic. An urgency lingers behind his black eyes. There is food, she says. There is food and clothes and water. But before you partake in the boom of the metal spire, you have to be cleansed of the outside world. You have to be stripped of your neuroses so you can be born anew. Cleansed, I ask. Taking another step back. Stripped? Yes, she says. One cannot be reborn if their being is still coked in the murk and grime of the outside world. You have made the journey to the metal spire. It is now time to purge yourself of all that has brought you here. She takes a step towards me and brushes her soft fingers against my hand. We can help you feel better, friend. You just have to trust us. A dark rumble from the cruel world outside drowns out the grinding of their teeth. The storm rages on, a reminder of an unwelcoming universe. But inside the cafeteria, inside of those strange dark eyes, I see a glint of hope. 
I see a promise of the crater in the core of my soul being filled with something of substance, something meaningful, something holy. Those eyes pull me towards surrendering myself, and I oblige. What do I need to do? I ask. Shed your clothes and follow me, she says, smiling. What? Reality crashes down on me harder than the thunder outside. Suddenly there's nothing holy in those dark eyes. It's, it's pure mania. I'm stranded in the belly of a broadcast tower in the middle of a thunderstorm. There's a group of unhinged, chinless strangers that want me to get naked. They're all grinding their teeth, seized by some frantic madness that I can't comprehend. Sane people don't end up in situations like this. No wonder she left me. It's kind of cold, I say. It's kind of cold. I just remembered I, I have a sandwich right here in my pocket. Yum! <laughs> I say, biting my way through the taste of wet cardboard. Their eyes remain focused on me, but those thin lips part. They're no longer smiling. Now they're just... They're just staring at me. Chewing. Uh, looks like the storm is loosening up, I say. Pretending that the violent black clouds outside don't exist. Her brow furrows. She's doing her best to hold up her polite smile, but there's confusion in her strange eyes. You have answered the call of the metal spire. You have traveled through the forest and conquered the mountain. Yet at the moment of redemption, you turn away. This was all just a spontaneous hike, I say. I didn't expect to make it this far. I'm I happy I made it out here, but I, I really should get going back home. I've got a bunch of work I need to finish before tomorrow. I don't give her a chance to change her mind. I take another bite of that tasteless sandwich and turn towards the door. There's an electrical fire burning in my legs. <laughs> I'm beyond ready to walk through a storm, beyond ready to do anything to get away from those strange-jawed creatures. Before she can say anything, my foot is out in the rain, yet as the world stretches out in front of me, my muscles go limp. The universe beyond the door is uninhabitable. There's no lookout point. There's no bench. There's no ground. What looms ahead of me is an, is an abyss of pitch black clouds littered with the faint streaks of far off lightning. One slip, one bad fall, the, the hiking trail is suicide. Please, she says, resting her hand on my shoulder. Reconsider. You came here for a reason. Let us help you. I barely feel her frail hand through my jacket. There's no harm in her eyes, and there's no real muscle on the bodies of her fellow travelers, and for a second I consider whether I'm not safer inside of the cafeteria, but that consideration's quickly thrown out. The mustached man's teeth continue chewing air, but with each rotation of his jaw, his thin lower lip droops lower and lower. An inhuman maw stretches out in front of me, his feet shuffle with hungry steps. The gnawing grows more and more erratic. The call of the metal spire, he says, as his mouth opens up past the limits of his neck. Is not to be refused. And with that, he lunges. Beyond his wide open mouth, I see a throat filled with dull, blocky teeth. They smash together with starving force as he flies through the air towards me. I face death, screaming and confused. For a second, my nose is filled with the stench of rot. The hot embrace of his jaw almost clenches over my pathetic body, but then... <sighs> she smacks him away with one swift motion. His body slams against one of the tables, sending a crack through the cafeteria that rivals the thunderclaps outside. But soon enough, he's back on his feet, chewing. <sighs> she hisses. But this time, the mustached man doesn't even look at her. His eyes stay glued to me. His jaw stays starving. The mouths of the robe procession start to descend in unison. There's a dozen hungry, tooth-filled throats aimed right at me. She shouts, arching her back like a wild animal. 
The cafeteria rocks at its foundation under the sheer strength of her shout. The rest of her procession, frightened by her show of force, takes a step back. But their jaws continue their grinding song of hunger. She shouts again, lurching forward, landing on all fours. The robe starts to ruffle. Beneath the cloth, the woman's body starts to grow. Her thin limbs raise her body above their heads. She's no longer the frail-looking girl I met by the bench. She's she's the long-limbed matriarch of a clan of demented monstrosities. She roars. The chomping of all but one jaw stops. The mustached man grinds his teeth for a few empty moments of defiance, but then he too relents. The creatures move to the back of the room and disappear behind the kitchen door. The creature in front of me shudders under long, labored breaths, but with each exhalation, her body moves closer to the ground. Soon enough, I'm standing in front of the same frail woman I met by that old bench. I'm alone with her. Who are you? I ask, half my body leaning out into the downpour. We are the keepers of the metal spire, she says, resting her hand on the shoulder of my jacket. There's no pressure, there's no weight, but I find my feet moving. The echoes of thunder die down as the door closes behind me. This place was not created by men. Men may have drawn the blueprints. They may have welded the steel and blended the concrete, but the metal spire was not created by men. It is a gift. A fevered vision brought down from the heavens to surveyors and architects. This is a place of healing which calls out in the night to the lost and broken. A place which can undo the cruel damage left behind from a world outside. A place that can help. We are the keepers of the spire. We are here to cleanse the pilgrims. To help those who have answered the call. Her long eyes blink for the first time. In her dark irises, I see the gentle soul of someone who wants to help. Whatever misery you have gone through, you deserve better, she says. You deserve to be reborn. How? I ask. Behind those small lips, a tightened jaw groans a grinding life. One has to be consumed to be born anew, she says. A spineless child masquerading as a man would stay behind. But I don't. I mumble a thank you and turn to the door. The storm still stretches out in front of me, but I know I can survive. If I move slowly, if I watch every step I take, I know I have it in me to make the descent. The call of the metal spire is not to be refused. Sorry, I say, shrugging her off and opening the door. I try to take another bite of my sandwich for sustenance, but I can't. I hear myself screaming before I recognize what's happening. My arm. My arm feels like every atom of its being was being held against a searing stove. The agony is so potent that it reverberates through the bones. The many-toothed matriarch gnaws on my limb. She's pulling me back into the cafeteria. Behind her, the rest of the wide-jawed pack emerges from the kitchen. They proceed towards me on all fours, their limbs slowly turning from those of humans to those of skin-covered spiders. With the small part of my mind that isn't submerged in soul-shattering pain, I order my other hand to grip against the side of the door. As I'm lifted off the floor, I kick, I writhe, I do whatever I can to free myself of her grip. Yet her many teeth continue their work uninhibited. My grip around the doorframe wavers. My fingers. They can't understand me through my panic. The sandwich is still in my hand, grasped in blind instinct, leaking rancid dressing along my knuckles. My grip loosens beneath the grease. I find myself dangling in the air, heading towards an infinite array of grinding bone. And then I fall. Above me, my jacket hangs from the jaws of the matriarch. In my hand, I'm still clutching mushed bread. Without a single thought, I dart out into the storm. I can feel them chasing me, but I don't look back. 
I run through the darkness and the rain, desperately praying that I'm not heading towards a cliff. I do not fall to my death, but I do fall. My body scrapes against sharp rock and tumbles down muddy hills when I'm certain that my bones have been broken and my skull has been hit hard enough to immobilize me, but I always do. I always get up. I don't know where I'm going, and I fear those long-limbed creatures emerging from the dark, but I keep on moving through the storm. The one thing that guides me is a pair of green and red lights out in the darkness. A metal spire calls out to me through the storm, and I do whatever I can to crawl away from that call. I wake up whole, but barely. A tranquil sea of moss spreads out around me, and rays of sun seep in through the tired trees. I'm alive, but barely. When I sit up, every inch of my body cries with pain and exhaustion. When I stand, my head spins with weakness. A malformed sandwich is still in my hand, still clutched like the safety blanket of a lost child. I take a bite. The bread is soggy and filled with specks of dirt, but my stomach is empty enough to accept anything. It doesn't taste good, but by the time I chew through the final bite, I feel stronger. My right arm is bruised beyond recognition. My left cut with shrubbery and sharp stones, but my legs still work. I trudge my way back to the train station, shuddering in my torn and bloody t-shirt. I consider calling her, but I don't. I sleep through most of the train ride back home, hoping to wake up in some grand revelation of the soul, but none comes. Instead, I shuffle my way through public transportation, try to avoid my neighbor's concerned gaze, and collapse into another bout of sleep as soon as I get past my front door. I wake up in the middle of the night, in my little bed, in my cramped apartment, floors littered with pizza boxes and takeout bags that I lack the strength to carry away. A molding glass of orange juice stares down at me from my dresser. I desperately hope to claw out some sort of lesson from my journey, some nugget of knowledge that would make it easier to carry on with my life, anything to make it easier to go back to sleep, but I don't. Instead, I cough, <coughs> and I cough, and I cough, and I cough. <coughs> By sunrise, the cough is joined with a fever. By noon, the fever brings delirium. By sundown, I'm barely aware of who I am. I see it, standing out in the hills, grey and defiant, a spaceship that'll fly us all to the moon. I feel her gentle touch. She asks me if I want some water. She swallows my arm. They walk towards me on all fours, lumbering above the ground like pale, hungry spiders. They demand I undress. The bright red and green eyes at the top of the spire call out to me through the night, offering me rebirth at the cost of my own annihilation. For three days, I drift in and out of consciousness, in a cocoon of sweat and confusion. I dream of the metal spire. I dream of the creatures. I dream of an ever-present impassable storm of dark clouds and jagged lightning. But in the morning of the fourth day, the clouds part. When I wake up, whatever rattling that plagued my lungs is, is still present, but my breath returns. I overindulge in water and bread. For a split second, I find myself happy that I'm still alive. I think about calling her, but I don't. Instead, I air out the house, wash out the moldy glass on my dresser, and overfill the recycling bin outside with the contents of my floor. Changing the sheets feels like a Herculean task, but when I lie down to sleep, it seems well worth it. The flashing lights of the broadcast tower still shine in the darkness of my dream, and I fear I'll hear that call until the end of time, but the storm is gone. The red and green beacons shine brighter than any star, but as the night drifts away, 
they're left without company. The dark sky reddens, and soon the metal spire and its electric beacons fade away in the blinding light of the rising sun. A warm morning caresses my face awake. I get out of bed feeling different. Feeling reborn. I think about calling her, but... But I don't. <laughs>